Good evening. Turn with us to your hymnal if you wish, or you can read it from the screens. Page 250, He Keeps Me Singing. If you hit the book out, you can do the harmony part from your place in the pew. Here we sing together. There's within my heart a Then we're going to come back and do the chorus slower after we sing it through the first time. Okay, ready? Third verse. Feasting on the rich. open up our service with a word of prayer if you would please dear Heavenly Father thank you for letting us gather here tonight in a nice dry building with electricity we overlook all the blessings of having these utilities until we lose them and we give you praise and glory for keeping the lights here at the building on and uh, be with our preacher as he preaches tonight and be with the song later and give you all praise and glory Amen. 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 We're going to turn over to page 258, and we're going to sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Now, when I was first saved, that's right one, right? 258? Okay. All right, 258. That's what I have on my paper, <clears throat> 258. When I was in, first got saved, and the, the pastor that I had was also the song leader all the time, he had a tendency during this song to say, when you said, when you ended up, he would turn and say, well, Jana, do you love Jesus? And you were supposed to say, oh, yes, I love Jesus. How do you know you love Jesus? Because he first loved me. So when I point at you tonight, okay, we're, uh, maybe I should just do the ones with the microphones on. What do you think? Amen. You can hardly wait for Brother Bill to get back, can you? <laughs> Let's sing the verses together, okay? There is a name I love.
And so if you'll get it to the fourth verse for me. There you got it. Aren't they good? They're ready. Sing with me. It tells of one whose loving heart fill my deepest woe. Who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Now we get music. Oh, how I love Jesus. Good stuff. We're glad that you're with us. Got a couple announcements, of course. We're looking forward to next week, and it reminds us of two or three things. Next Sunday night, we have one of our church plants. Pastors is going to be back here with us, and I'm looking forward to having him in. We're his home church, actually. I started one in Montana, and uh, we're, we're Manhattan, Montana, and it is not anything like Manhattan, New York, I promise you, okay? And so it's sort of like Paris, Texas. It's a little bit different. Well, we're looking forward to that, and we'll, he'll be uh, here with us. And we're looking forward to having Brother Toby in and have him sh show you some things. He's bringing a little bit of, of video and stuff to show you what he's got. God's blessed him greatly there. He has a lot of needs, of course, in a startup, but he's done really well. And I, I've been excited for him and looking forward to having him here with us. His name, of course, is his uncle, a namesake of his uncle passed away. And you remember to pray for all of that family when you're praying, we have so many prayer requests that are so necessary and needy. If you have anybody in the military right now, you need to be praying for them just for um, just for the ability. It is kind of they're in a, a what would I say? It is in an unstable time. And so uh, long term plans are, um, are pretty much put on hold. And we're just waiting to see what you're going to do day by day. And you need to pray for them and ask God to be with those who are being deployed and put out and, um, and around the world. Thank God for them. Amen. I, I appreciate that greatly. And all of you who have served, don't, don't, don't think we don't. I want you to, I don't think that you ought to be able to pass by a police officer without telling them thank you for what you're doing. You know, I don't know about you, but I have a pretty quiet, nice neighborhood because police officers patrol there. I like it. And so we're grateful for them. You pray for them as they do as well. And of course, all those people that are in charge of all that. We, uh, we had a letter this morning from Haiti, from our uh, longtime missionary that's there. And uh, Dr. Alexander was, was a Haitian that come to America and got saved here. He and his wife both. He had went to medical school first, being a medical doctor. And his wife is a PA. And God called him back to Haiti 25 years ago, easy. And we've supported them ever since they went back. It's a turmoil time there because their president was assassinated. In that, that ha you, you can imagine what that would do to your country. And they're not even sure inside, outside, what it is. And Haiti's also so sta unstable anyhow. And so just keep them in your prayers and, and that they can reach the people that God's called them to reach and uh, the rest of our missionaries. Uh, let's see. Do we have any other announcements that have to be made? I'm kind of filling in for us tonight. I think we're ready to do our special. So I'm going to ask the trio to come up here. Do you know the difference between our trio and a quartet? One person. That's it. Amen. That's it. So I didn't know if you knew that or not, but I'm filling you in. So, right. We're going to do a song that we, we kind of like. It's an old song and we'll... You can figure it out where we got the thought from. It was not going to be this until just a few minutes ago. <laughs> For those of you who are watching this on the video, we have a miracle in our own midst here in Texas. Uh, we have rain on the first day of August in Texas. You know, the last time that happened, I was three years old. <laughs> I remember it. It's rare. So, but, uh, you were here. Huh? <laughs> but I still remember it. You know what I mean? So it's a that's a rare thing for us. We're excited about it. We have a thunderstorm going on, believe it or not. And uh, for those of you who get those all the time during the summer, they don't happen here like that. OK, you know, so we're we're kind of excited and a little scared. And maybe Jesus will come back in the middle of all this. He'll fix it once. But the song is it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. It wasn't raining 
when Noah built the ark. So the rush for the door didn't start till it grew dark. Don't wait till the judgment to give the Lord your heart. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. From a babe in a manger to a cross on a hill. Jesus made the journey God's plan to fulfill. In love he has done what he said he would do. The next book is up to me and you. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. So the rush to the door didn't start till it grew dark. Don't wait till the judgment to give the Lord your heart. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Everybody's wondering what's up ahead. Storm clouds are gathering just like the Bible said. We have a shelter that never will fail. There's a whole ship of signs about to sail. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. So the rush for the door didn't start till it grew dark. Don't wait till the judgment to give the Lord your heart. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. The rush for the door didn't start till it grew dark. Don't wait till the judgment to give the Lord your heart. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. As we went, it worked pretty well. I'm excited about that. If you got your Bible, I want you to look back with me into the book of Matthew. Uh, chapter 21. We'll be there in just a second. And I get my computer up here and run. We're excited about all the great things that go on. And one of the great things that God has allowed us to do is to be able to have computer systems. Isn't that good? You know? I mean, isn't that great? It is a good thing, guys. You know, what would y'all do with your time if it wasn't for your phone? I saw a meme the other day and it showed heaven and the angels were looking at all the guys, everybody in heaven, and the angels were saying, why are all of them doing this all the time? Got it together. If you have your Bible, let's look there together. We're going to read chapter 21, verse, I mean, excuse me. We're going to read chapter 21, verse 28 through 32. It is the parable of the two sons. And I'm going to repeat what I said this morning. You know, the parables would not be understandable if you didn't know that they were actually like riddles and the Lord gave the answers to what they were as we go through it. Y'all know what a riddle is, right? Mm -hmm. All right. There's, we used to have missionary in riddle. That's what one of them is. The other one is that it's, they're trying to get you to guess the answer. You know, in Sunday school this morning, I said there was a riddle. It's a lot longer than this one. It says, I was created before Adam. I am an animal, but I had a human soul inside of me. There may be one of me. There may be thousands of me. Who am I? Well, it's pretty easy. It's a whale. Remember, he was created before man, but he swallowed Jonah. See, there you go. Y'all are so hyper tonight. It's wondering. You, you got wet and your brunt shrank up. But anyhow, y'all cut that. Whatever happened out there with it, we're going to get with it. Now, book of... Matthew chapter 23, and we're going to look down together, excuse me, chapter 21, in verse number 28. Uh, this portion from 23 down to 27 and 20, 33 on down is found two or three other places. But the portion that I want to read to you tonight is found particularly only in Matthew. It's got a little piece of it. And you'll see some of that there, but some of the, the words are but a line or two, but as a whole, it's only found in Matthew. When you're talking about the Gospels, there are four Gospels, and God did that for a purpose. If you go back to the book of Ezekiel, in chapter number one, 
Ezekiel described a creature that had four sides and four faces, one on each side, the face of a man, the face of an ox, the face of a lion, the face of an eagle. And he said when it went, it never turned. It just moved from one way to the other to get where it was going. And he, you'll find him describing it two or three different times in the book of Ezekiel. And for years and years, people were talking about it must be some space alien or it's not. It's not. It's a picture type of the four Gospels. Matthew sees the Lord Jesus as the rightful heir to the throne, the king, a lion. Mark sees him as an absolute servant to humanity, an ox. Luke sees him as this magnificent, one-of-a-kind specimen of humanity, a man. And John sees him as the Son of God come down from heaven to be among us from an eagle's point of view. So it's not really hard to figure out. And God didn't mean for him to see him the same. You say, well, all the Gospels, some of them have <clears throat> things that differ a little bit. You know, if they all said exactly the same thing, it would only be one Gospel. There are certain things in it that you can find that aren't in the other ones. When you're looking at certain portions of Scripture, you can take all four Gospels and understand why God did what He did. And I preach messages just on that. And once when they were in a storm, they're out rowing, and the Lord can see them, and He gets on the water and walks out to them. And if you look through the portion, I'm not going to get into that tonight, it said, and the Lord would have passed them by. Why would He just pass them by? Well, when you compare all four of the Gospels together, he told them to go east. They went west. They didn't want to go over them heathen people. They wanted to go back to Capernaum. There are three or four different things that he had said to them. They weren't looking for him. They were looking at the storm. We could just keep going on and on. But one of the things we learn, you know, if you're looking out in your lifetime, you're saying, well, where's the Lord at in this? Maybe he didn't put you there. I would heard a long time ago that if, if it don't seem like the Lord's with you, maybe he stopped and you didn't, or maybe you left and he didn't. That's your job to stay where the Lord puts you and do what he tells you to do when he tells you, and you've you got to stay right with God. This parable is a really neat one. It said a certain man, remember that, what I told you this morning in, in my Bible study? The Bible's filled up with that. That certain man talks to Joseph. That certain man does this. That certain, And if you, if you look at it long enough, it is this picture type thing of, a, of the Lord Jesus being among us. He's the one that has the vineyard. He creates the stuff. He knows those things. It's kind of good. What think you? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Now listen to the question. Whither of the twain did the will of his father? Now he's speaking now to the, to the chief priest and to those who are over the temple because they ask him about who gave you the authority, why are you doing this, and all that. And, he's, and he, he gives them the, then that answer back. He answers most everything with a question. Why didn't you, did you believe John? And they, of course they said they couldn't say what, they couldn't answer him. And so now he's asking them a question. And, and he's asking them, which of these two did the will of the Father? The first one said, I'm not going to do it. But he repented and went and did it. And the second one said, I'm going to go do it, but never went. Which one of them? And, and, and pretty easy, same as I would answer. They said unto him, the first. Now Jesus said unto them, Verily I tell you unto you, the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you do. I'm waiting for one of the disciples to say, You know you hurt their feelings? Really? For John came unto you. He's making this statement about what they said about John. They weren't going to, they're just going to let it go. Let me tell you real quick. When it comes to faith in God and the faith in God's word and all things go with it, not making a stand, not making a choice, is a ch it's not a third choice. You made a choice. 
when you refuse the Word of God, when you refuse faith, you've made a choice. There is no neutral in this thing. You understand that? There's not, you know, well, I was going to wait, Lord, until I died and then make a choice. The Bible says it's appointed unto men to die and then once to die and then the judgment. When you die without Christ, you made your choice. And they're not wanting to do that. The other thing is, Jesus said, look at what they're doing. The absolute wrong thing, Christian, is, is to be afraid of people. They would not tell you who they were in four or five different instances because they were afraid of the people. They sound like politicians today. You can't get the truth out of them because they're afraid they won't get reelected. I want somebody to tell me the truth. At least I know who to vote for next time. Amen? I don't want a preacher that's not going to tell me the truth. I'd find me somebody that's going to tell me the truth, whether I liked it or not. You're going to have to decide whether the Word of God is the truth or it's not the truth. And they're saying, Verily I said, the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you do. And he's telling them why. Because John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when you had seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe in him. The parable is to, given to reveal the hypocrisy and deceit of the priest, those who were in charge, whether it's the high priest, or the, the members. Sometimes I'll use the word Sanhedrin. You, you hear me say that? That's a collective term where the priests and the scribes and the lawyers, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all those who were in charge, those who had temple offices and things that were inside of it, they all made up this like ruling Supreme Court thing of judgments, and they called it the Sanhedrin. Jesus said, and he spoke to the multitude. He liked to do that. By the way, when you look at this one, it's the same thing. They're over here talking to him. His disciples are here. You know, you'll find when you go back, he, he said he speaks to the people and to his disciples. See this? He tells them in another place in Matthew 23, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They do have the authority that was given by God for somebody to be in charge over this practice of the worship of Jehovah. All therefore whatsoever they bid you, observe. That observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. They say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens, grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. I can hardly wait till everybody I know that's proposing that we no longer use fossil fuels to quit driving a car or flying an airplane or heating their homes. How about you guys? All right, I'm, I'm excited. They're going to give all that up. How many of you believe that those of us that are, in, that are, that are going to require that soon enough with us are going to give it? No, nope, they'll be the privileged class. That's what these people did. They became the privileged class. They got to do whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, with no kind of consequences to it. And yet they had the authority at their whim to put someone to death. And they proved it with the Lord Jesus. Not one accusation against him could they prove. They just brought all kinds of accusations against his character that were not true. That's against the law of Christ, and it's against the law of the Levitical law, and it's against ours. But all their works they do, remember what I told you? Beware of somebody that does stuff to be seen of people, for to be seen of men. This is what he's talking to them about. He just pretty much said, you're not worthy to be in the office you're in. When Paul, the apostle Paul is being questioned, one of the men slaps him in the face. And Paul says, the Lord will smite you, that whited wall. And one of the men said, you can't talk that way to the high priest. And he said, I didn't know he was the high priest. 
especially since the break broke the law and slapping me without me having any charges. I, I'm one of those people I believe is, you, know, you say God gave me great things and I expect great things out of you. My sister and, and I were, older sister were saved not too far apart. And we had a wonderful pastor. And um, I don't know what happened with it. I just remember the situation that went on. And, you know, preachers a lot of times promise things that they know they can't carry through. You know what, what I mean? And especially if you have one that works a job outside the church and he's not available to be at everything you want him to do. And uh, I, don't, I don't know an answer to that other than to say, if you want me to be at everything, pay me more money, right? But, uh, and I worked at, I, I pastored churches for years and years, guys, that never paid me any kind of salary. Right? Don't get upset with me when I can't be at your surgery. I have to have a job too, right? All right. That's not true right now. And that's a good thing. The reason I didn't come to your surgery is because I don't like you. Okay. That's <laughs> has nothing to do with the job right now. I just didn't like you. All right. But I, I showed up at a lady's surgery and she said, you know what? You're not fit to be a pastor. I said, why? She said, because, you know, anybody else that would have given up their job. And I said, can I stop you a minute? And I said, I'm just going to start with, and I know you're fixing to go in. This is really serious surgery. You may not live. You may not die. You almost never come to church. You haven't tithed since the first time I ever met you. You cuss like a sailor. And you're going in to have surgery right now. The last thing you want to do is get the only guy who's praying for you angry at you. She lived through it, okay? But my sister told her pastor, she said, you know, are, are pastors going to get special rewards for being a pastor? Well, the scripture says we will. Peter said that. She said, I expect you to live like it here then. You know, I, that's been the cry of my life. If I believe that, then I ought to live it. So should every Christian. Are we called to a higher calling? Absolutely, guys. Are we called to tell the truth? Is, if you can fool everybody in church into thinking you're right with God, does that make you right with God? I'm telling you what's wrong with our churches is what's wrong with our country. We've got Christian people who have a pretense but no action behind the pretense. And that's exactly what Jesus reprimanded. These, he said, you got these two sons. One said, I'm not going. He's talking about the harlots and the publicans, and they didn't observe. Well, John came and preached repent. They, got, they repented. But when he preached repent to them, the only thing that happened to John is they didn't help him a bit. I promise you that if they'd have put in a word for him with Herod, they'd have got him out of that prison. Not one of them said one thing about getting him out of prison because they didn't care. And Jesus said, why don't you believe him? The harlots and the publicans are going to go in. And I want you to get this. This is a big word right here. When you look back at this, did you see it with me? Look back what he says. Verse number 20, 31. Verily I say unto you, the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of not heaven, but the kingdom of God. That's a serious statement from the mouth of the absolute right there. So we're not talking about where we are. I'll explain that in a minute a little better. The parable is given to reprove them for their disbelief in John's ministry. Jesus said, John, if he had been believed, would have been counted as the Elijah. That's what he said. Elijah has come. You just didn't believe him when he came. And the Lord would have set up his kingdom on the earth. They rejected their king because they rejected the one that could make it possible for him to be king. But he came as the Savior. First you repent. First, you have to be fit for the kingdom of God. Every Christian knows that. Everybody. You say, well, preacher, I'm just going to, I'm going to serve God and I'm going to do so much for God that he has to let me into heaven. Have you ever wondered about that? You ever read what God can do just off the top of your hand? You know, like, let there be light and the whole universe has light in it. I don't know anybody I know can do that. David said he knows the stars by number and knows, calls them all by name and he casts them out with the span of his hand. And Now one more time, tell me what it was you was going to do to impress him. I forgot. What was you going to do to impress him? 
Jesus answered and said, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I am likewise will tell you what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, when was it from? Heaven or men? They reasoned and said, if we say from heaven, he will say, why did you not then believe him? Not one of them said, we believed him. You notice there's a line missing out of that. We believed him. But they said, if we say of men, we fear the people for all hold John as a prophet. Their own statement condemned themselves. The worst sinners, the worst sinners were the first ones to repent, according to them. Now, how many of you got like, like tax collectors? Y'all like tax collectors? There's a hundred million tax collector jokes. Very few IRS people watch these videos, so I'm going to tell you one of them. Oh, yeah. The story goes that there's a IRS guy, and he's going in. The old lady has three or four different notices that she's behind, and they're going to go in and collect the stuff. You know, and so he goes in, he said, and I have to have the keys to your car. We're taking your car. And she's crying and begging. It's the only car I got. And the only way I have to go somewhere. And, you know, I won't be able to go to the doctor. And I won't be able to go. And he goes, and he goes I, got, I got to have the keys. And he's taking the keys and walking out to get the car. And she's falling out, dragging, holding on to him. And she's begging him, please. And he turns around and says, Mom, it's my job. <laughs> hmm? We say from heaven. You're like tax collectors? That's what the publicans were. They were the guys that were collecting taxes for Rome. By the way, Jesus never told them to quit doing it. He said, start doing it honestly. We'd be in tough shape. Somebody didn't do that, wouldn't they? they by their own mouth, they condemned themselves. Jesus said of John, what would you want to see? A prophet? He said, more than a prophet. He of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. That's who John was. He was the one that had got to introduce Jesus to the world. You think about this statement. We talked about it in Bible study this morning. For the first time, those Jewish people that were listening to John Say, repent and come back to Judaism. Repent and come back to Judaism. Because you see, the only way to get through Jesus was through the Old Testament practice. He's the one that became our great high priest. You had to have one to get that one. You had to have that offering. You had to have the picture types of the Passovers and all the lambs. You know, and John does the strangest thing right off. The, we're as Christians. We don't even think about what he said. Everybody there's mouth must have fell open. Because he said, looked at Jesus, he said, said behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. They've never heard that. He did the Passover of the sins of the people of Israel. John points at him and said, this is the one that's going to take away the sin of the whole world. What do you think? That must have been in conversation the next week. John must have made a mistake. He didn't make a mistake. He's the one who got to introduce the Lord to the world. That's who he went out to see. The worst of sinners who repented were preferable to these men. I, I don't care what position you have. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you're lost. Did you hear me? You're lost. Well, you don't understand. I'm very well educated. Then you're an educated lost person. I don't care what position you hold in power or any place else. These would not repent. If they wouldn't repent and go back to what they knew was right in the Old Testament, how would they move forward to Christ? And they never did. Their only solution was, now that John's gone, we'll just get rid of him too. That's the answer. If you go back and listen to that, read it in the Matthew, they start right there and saying, from this time forward, they sought how they might conspire against him and kill him. That was their plan. Let's get him out of the way. The lost sheep that was rescued. You remember that parable? The sheep wanders off. Jesus said, you go out, leave the 99, go get the one. L look what it says. 
I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. More than over in 99 just persons. Look at this one. The lost coin that was found. You know it was that woman's fault? She lost a coin. It was her fault. I don't know if it was the shepherd's fault or not. Shepherd, sheep have a tendency, if you got a hundred of them, it'd be like trying to corral a hundred four-year-olds together, right? If you lose one, that's like accessible collateral damage, whatever goes with it, right? But this woman, she loses the coin in the dirt and in the dark. Those are not good things in a Christian's life. The dirt and the dark. What happened when she found it? I love the story, guys. She put her coin back in her headband, took her husband's money, and gave a party. <laughs> Called all the friends over and had a party. Read the book, okay? Jesus is on, he's the one that tells the story. Likewise, in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repented. Have, have you seen a repetition here on, on these two stories? Have you seen the third story? The son who repented? Every one of them comes from a place as a picture type or the reality of every relationship we have with God it starts with us repenting. Do you remember being saved? <clears throat> Did you tell God if you'll come over here where I'm at, we can walk together? You didn't. You had to go God's way. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and we repented. Oh, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, I, I want you to do something. In every message I have, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that we're going to condemn all the Jewish people, okay? Because I found out that Christians are, are not much better. We get so accustomed to being able to just talk to God and forget what a privilege it is that God's promised to hear you. He hears lost people, but he promised to hear you. He said he'd answer your prayers. You might not like the answer. Sometimes he just says no. But he'll answer those prayers. When he might not change your situation, he'll change you to fit it. He does wonderful, marvelous things. We get so used to praying. We're surprised now when we pray for somebody and they don't get well. Have you notice that? What happened? When we're, 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 we're accustomed to God answering our prayers. He does foolish things sometimes compared to what God's ought to be doing. Do you remember when we first started the church here and there was like 20 of us? And we had 40 folding brown metal chairs without cushions. Do you remember that? We had a little keyboard that came from Walmart, I think, okay? And we were trying to get that thing to work. And we got together and said, oh, we need pews. We just need pews. And there weren't these pews. They, these were special made. We're rich now. We could afford pews <laughs> special made for this building, amen? And we had a church that was going out of business. They had closed down and... And they, they had just had pews made, and they sent them over. They gave them to us. And at the time, they matched the carpet. We didn't care if they were purple. We just wanted something to sit on, remember? They matched the carpet. We were all going, oh, look at that. They're brand new. They matched the carpet. God didn't have to do that. They could have been whatever. God does wonderful, marvelous things for us. He does. We get used to that. We're like children who are spoiled sometimes. We, somebody has my dinner on the table and somebody does this for me and somebody takes care of me and I need money and I'm going to go to a birthday party next week and we forget that we're, we're not the parents sometimes. Somebody's putting out, I had a young man tell me last week, he was telling me all the great things his parents did for him. He said, you know, they're just filthy rich. I know his parents, they're struggling. They're putting their life into it to give him stuff that he wants. He believes it's just because they have such an abundance, they just drop it off on him. 
What a shame you can't see that. We have a great privilege as Christians to walk with God. In every instance in these different parables, he talks about the really important thing that it parallels with is repenting. We see it better, I guess, in the sun. Jesus said, I tell you, but except you repent, you shall likewise perish. He said, you see, you hear about that tower over there that fell, and you hear what, you know, Pilate did to these people and killed them. He said, except you repent, you're going to perish. See, there's not an exception if we do or don't. And I know we're not going to perish. I'm saved. I'm sealed by the Spirit of God, and so are you. But we go through life sometimes so haphazard without remembering what we owe the Lord. We could never pay it. We sometimes forget we didn't deserve it. And we kind of walk in the gray area a little bit out there. And we forget. You know who gets into God's presence? The repenters. Not one person here has ever called out to God saying, Lord, I'm sorry. And the Lord said, I'm going to listen to you. He does it every time. What think you, a certain man? Whither of them do they? Look at this. They said the first but it passed right over them. You can get so hard that you don't see what's obvious in front of you. They're making a statement. They believe this will satisfy him. The first one did. We, we know all that. You're, you're going to be, we're all going to be held accountable for what we know, right? And what we don't know. The Israelites, good men or bad men, all belong to the Father by redemption. I want you to get that. The Lord bought Israel. I can show you three times in the Old Testament. He said, I gave Egypt for you. I gave Moab for you. I gave, he redeemed them. They were his. Just like we're bought with a price. They had no right to be able to say, well, we'll do just whatever we want. Because they were bought with a price. Paul told us that we're supposed to glorify God in our body because we're bought with a price. How many times are we guilty of forgetting that? You say, well, preacher, I don't do anything wrong. And your memory's bad too. You know what I'm amazed at? And I'm going to say something to you that I want you to think about. I know how convenient it is to let the television babysit your kids. Are you watching what your kids are watching? Do you believe in spiritualism, demon powers? That's what your kids are watching on 90% of the shows they're watching. You say, well, preacher, I just don't think it bothers you. <clears throat> I talked to a guy a couple of years ago who got saved from Oliver B. Green's preaching. Oliver B. Green was an evangelist pastor from the North Carolina area who died 45 years ago. He heard him just a few years ago on tape and he got saved listening to that preaching. J. Vernon McGee is having thousands of people. He probably has more people saved now that he's gone to heaven than he did when he was alive and pastoring a church because his ministry went worldwide. They just played those things over and over and over. Do you know you can watch a, a video of Billy Graham and trust, even though he's dead, you can watch a video of Billy Graham and get saved? Y'all are out there looking at me. Now you're like, the fair, you ain't going to say nothing. I'm not saying nothing, preacher. <laughs> As soon as I do, you're going to call me out for it, right? I'm not saying anything. If that's possible, 
Could not your kids and you and everybody else be influenced by what you watch in a television show? You say, well, preacher, it's just so convenient. You know, you say, here's the boob tube, stick at it, do what you can. I come in the other day, I outlawed all my grandkids with, with me this summer, one time or another. And they watch those YouTube things. Okay, I know there must be really good things on YouTube. I learned how to fix stuff by looking at YouTube and things. But they had these whole bunch of guys doing these really stupid things in front of the kids. You know what they did? They took a guy and they put him in a plastic garbage bag and they put a vacuum cleaner in and sucked all the air out of it so it would mold to his body to see what he looked like if he was... Have you ever told your kids not to play with a plastic bag? If I ask you to raise your hands, part of y'all saw that. What are you watching? Okay, now I'm going to move on. I, I have people, I'm not a movie watcher, so my wife got used to that years ago. And I've tried really hard. I love sitting next to her. But after a while, you know, they, they do such dumb things. They go, you can't do that. That won't work like that. There's, that's not possible. They're, she goes, go somewhere else, will you? Okay, I'm watching the movie. So, that goes with it. I'm not much of a movie watcher, but I will tell you, I can remember scenes from movies that I wished I'd never seen. You say, well, preacher, what are you talking about? Do you read your Bible as much as you watch TV? Oh, man, I'm going to get tomatoes now. I'm going to quit right there before I get in big trouble. You know how easy it is to walk a little bit on the outside and forget you're pulling away from God and get so used to it you don't repent. See, I believe that's a big thing. You know what a revival is? It's when God's people realize where they are compared to where the Lord is and they go back. I got good people in this church, guys. I, I brag about you and love you, and you do tremendous things. But it really is easy to kind of just move out a little bit further than you should be. All the things in this, it didn't make any difference if they were good men or bad men or good repute. It is, were they right with God? Were they right with God? See what he said? I gave Egypt for thy ransom. Ethiopian, I'm going to go move forward. It's not Jews or Gentiles. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about the church. John the Baptist and Jesus and all the apostles were sent out to the Jews. Go not to weigh the Gentiles. He's talking it isn't about that church thing to come. He's talking about, are you as God's people doing what God wants you to do? Now, I understand. It's really easy to get out there and get away. But I'm going to challenge you to do something. And I'm moving forward really fast on this, okay? <clears throat> John preached, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. If I ask you how many people in the last two weeks you've actually witnessed to, how you doing? I, I don't, folks, I don't have any problem telling you how hard it is to talk to people. I have a lady in my neighborhood that jogs around the neighborhood every day. Sometime or a day I pass her. I've lived there 15 years now. At least once a week, I'll go, hey, how you doing? She stares at me and just walks on, drunk, whatever. I'm not giving it up. I'm going to make her say hello to me someday. Well, the other day, something was going on, and I did something I almost never, ever do. I went out of the house in my pajamas. People thought I was going to Walmart, but I wasn't. <laughs> I walked out in my pajamas, 
And lo and behold, the lady was driving right in front of me. And for the first time ever, she stopped and goes, hey, how you doing this morning? I said, I'm all right. You know, I want to go back in now because I don't. You're having a great day. I, have, I see you got. St-. And she went fine. I finally said, I got to go now. Talk to you later. You know what I mean? Never spoke to me before. I told Cheryl that was I came in and told Cheryl that. I think she just knew I was embarrassed. OK, <laughs> think about that. But I don't know how it is to talk to people. That don't mean we're supposed to quit. Somebody somewhere needs you to tell them about Jesus. You say, well, preacher, I'm going to leave that up to you. It's not all my job. See, that's we're, we're talking about repentance here. You thought about that? We're not talking about... I haven't, any of you guys robbed a bank lately? If you hadn't tithed on it, I haven't seen it, so okay. If you rob a bank, you've got a tithe on it. Then I'm turning you in. <laughs> the reward will be more than the tithe. And y'all know that. You know, you've got to figure these things out. You, you aren't robbing banks, and you aren't killing people, and you're not using drugs. And Okay, I know who you are. You're the best of the best. But sometimes it's easy for the best of the best to forget that we ought to be like David and say, Lord, search my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. You have permission to do that. You don't have to do that at church. You say, well, preacher, what I need is just some Christian to hold my hand. you got the Lord God of heaven. And you need to learn to be his friend. When you're sad, tell him. You get angry at him, Tell him. You say, I can't. I'm not telling God. He knows. Or he already knows. When you know what you're supposed to do, tell him. Except you repent. You think about that. The condemnation that he gave them is they knew they should have repented and didn't do it. Now I'm going to close with this. David got caught in a terrible sin. Two years, at least, he went hiding it. I'm going to tell you what the Lord does. He gives you as a Christian a time to repent. And you come to him in that time, and you and him will take care of it. But I promise you, if you do like David and you hide it, he'll make it public. He will. You say, well, I don't want that. Whatever it is you're dealing with. Dr. Dobson says that more than 10% of every church is bound up in some kind of pornography. I don't know about that. You do. You know what the movies you're not supposed to be watching. You know the things. You know the friends you're not supposed to have. You know the places you're not supposed to go. We don't need to know all that stuff. You need to take care of it before God exposes it. I promise you, I've never seen it not happen. I see pastors all the time. If they would just got right with God back there, Nobody would ever known it right now. Don't wait. I'm going to ask us to have a word of prayer. And I want you to think, this is my church group right here. You see us? When you come to church in the middle of a storm, you're, you're probably pretty close to God. Because everybody that was looking for an excuse got one tonight, didn't they? Hmm? God's, I think he's, we're going to have to get close enough to God for him to do something with our church. I, I don't I don't particularly like just existing. We're existing rather well, by the way. I want us to reach people. And the only way we can do that is if the Spirit of God uses us to do it. It's not mystical. It's just us being with God, doing what he wants all the time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how wonderful it is to be your servant. And Lord, there's a million things, and I'm not kidding, that I could brag about my church and what she does and my people and how kind they are and how loving they are. And 
Lord, the things they do for missions and for other people, and Lord, it's just tremendous, the vision that they keep. But Lord, with that, we're concerned that we get so used to walking with God that we don't notice when we're not. And for some reason, you laid this on my heart. And Lord, I want to remind you, like David, you have the right to examine my heart any time, see if there's anything wicked in it. And then, Lord, to bring me to a place of repentance. I'm praying that my people tonight, sitting where they are, listening online, would say, Lord, you have the right to do that with me too. Bless us, Lord, not with things and stuff, but with your presence. That has to be the greatest treasure any of us have in this world. And we pray, Lord, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me just a minute. Come every soul. Oh, play I'm just as I am. Just as I am without one thing, but that I but worship for me, and that thou be equal to me, O Lamb of God, I come. I found out this last week something about that song I'd never known before. It's in your hymnal. It must be the most sung invitational song there is. When the lady wrote that, she had been a paraplegic for 37 years. And God still had something for her to do. Amen. Let's be dismissed with a word of prayer. Brother Mike. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message today. Thank you for the rain this evening. Amen. Uh, pray that you would uh, help us to do your will and be the, the son that that does what we're supposed to do, Lord. Uh, pray that uh, we would talk to people about you this week, be an example of your love, Lord. Uh, pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.